For many veteran gamers, the road into the medium was paved at least in part by licensed video games. The promise of new adventures with familiar faces was enough to coax many into picking up a controller. Licensed games still exist these days in more abstract forms or out of nostalgia for the originals, but in years past, a licensed video game was often a different way to experience a story told in another medium. Any hit TV show or major motion picture was sure to have a video game released alongside it. The quality of these games could vary greatly. Sometimes you'd get something excellent like most of the games in the Disney Afternoon Collection, and sometimes you'd get stuck playing Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Even today, the quality runs the gamut. Sometimes you get The Walking Dead, and sometimes you get... The Walking Dead. Every gamer has a licensed game or two that they like, whether it's something they grew up with or something they played at the right time of their life. But what about everything else? Since genre-defining titles like GoldenEye 007 or Turok Dinosaur Hunter are few and far between, it's easier to think of the licensed games that don't work, like Superman 64, or fail to innovate like Mickey's Speedway USA. But that's true of all games, isn't it? To paraphrase a certain critic, Not every game can have good game design, but good game design can come from anywhere. One such place is the tie-in game to Pixar's sophomore outing, A Bug's Life, and the game's 12th level, Lead the Revolt. Disney and Pixar's A Bug's Life is a simple, 15-level 3D platformer that roughly follows the movie's story. Each level is either a simple obstacle course, a scavenger hunt, or a boss fight, complicated by the inclusion of two different power-up systems revolving around seeds and berries. Seeds are used for different platforming challenges. You start each level with the power to plant bouncy mushrooms, and can grow bigger and better plants by collecting different colored metals. Among these are purple metals, which can be used to grow the game's other main power-up, berries. Berries are your main weapon, and like with seeds, you can upgrade them as you go. You start with red berries, then move on to blue super berries, green homing berries, purple mega homing berries, and finally reach gold berries. You'll want to unlock the gold berries as quickly as you can on each level, since enemies defeated by them won't respawn. Normally, you're stuck looking for the lone gold berry pickup on a given stage, but if a level has purple metals, you can freely grow as many of them as you want. This is important if you want to clear everything in the game, as the game grades you on how many enemies you permanently defeat in a given level. In addition to how many pieces of grain and letters of your character's name, F-L-I-K spells flick. That's me. You're able to collect. The game itself is divided into five acts, with Lead the Revolt being the boss level at the end of the fourth act. The game introduces a scenario not present in the movie, where Flick rallies the rest of his ant colony against the main villain's brother, Molt, in a battle arena. Most of the elements in this level are familiar. You have a lot of collectibles condensed in a small space, a seed for platforming and powering up, and a couple enemies to defeat. The common enemies are spiders, the first enemies fought in the game, while Molt just copies the attack pattern of the common grasshopper enemy, wandering around his home and charging you if you get close. Like other grasshoppers, Molt cannot be defeated by your initial red berries, but blueberries will clean his clock. All you have to do is collect a single purple metal, sprout a purple seed, and he's easy pickings. All of this makes for a simple boss fight. In fact, THE simplest, since the first boss could at least fly, and every other boss features far more complex arenas. The fight even takes place in a section of the first level, reusing part of its map. So looking at all these elements, Bolt feels really out of place in the game's back half. Or at least that he'd be a complete joke boss. But there is one other thing. Remember the rest of the ant colony that you're rallying? They're all around the borders of the arena, watching the fight go down. They'll shout words of encouragement, and even occasionally throw in power-ups to help you. These power-ups, when collected, turn Flick's berries... red. No, there's no hidden secrets here. These are the same red berries you started out with. 
The same ones that can at best maybe slow Molt down for a split second and nudge him just a step or two away as they uselessly bounce off his exoskeleton. And all these other ants just keep throwing him in! The player quickly figures out the gimmick of this fight is less about the enemies or the platforming, both trivial compared to some of the game's previous challenges, and more about the well-meaning NPCs. This little arena turns into a minefield of power-ups that the player has to navigate through, and this is especially challenging if the player is going for a perfect run of the level, since the 60 collectibles and 4 enemies are staggered out just enough that you're always at risk of being blindsided by red berries. But hey, you can't exactly call the fight unfair, right? It is against the easiest enemies in the game, and it's not like you can't regrow more berry pickups while dodging enemies and power-ups alike. But there are two details to note here. First, the red berry pickup only exists in this level. Nowhere else in the game can it become impossible to defeat an enemy by changing Flick's berries. Second, the game actively acknowledges what's going on. The talkative Flick will harp on his allies, saying, Enough with the red berries! And in a particularly clever touch, the game will sometimes sub in voice clips for taking damage when Flick accidentally picks up red berries. Oh, come on! What the game has done here is tell a joke about its own power-up system. Now this is far from the only game to make a gag out of its mechanics. Any game with joke equipment like Symphony of the Night with its secret boots and Alucard gear, or any game that creates an obstacle meant to imitate its power-ups like Mario's Poison Mushrooms or Sonic's Robotnik marks, is doing the same kind of thing. Several games also tell jokes more akin to A Bug's Life's, where a power-up becomes an obstacle. Krokobe's Winners Don't Do Shrooms is a great demonstration of this in Super Mario Maker, and Cave Story's Nemesis weapon redefines the player's relationship with the game's upgrade system. However, few games tell the specific joke that A Bug's Life does. For the other jokes to work, those games needed to introduce a subversion to their systems, something that behaves against the expected pattern and rewrites the rules. The red berry pickup is more a logical extension of A Bug's Life's existent rules. The game's weapons exist in a hierarchy system represented by colors. The first tier weapon is too weak to defeat certain enemies. The highest tier weapon is needed to earn the high score on a level. It's possible to sequentially unlock higher weapon tiers by collecting specific medals, and it's possible to jump directly to any other weapon tier by collecting its corresponding power-up, which exists separately from the metal system. With these rules in mind, all the game's really doing is completing the set of power-ups by introducing one to correspond with your base weapon tier, then pointing out the inherent absurdity of that by weaponizing it against the player. This is an incredibly complicated joke the game is telling, based on a fairly involved power-up system, and it's doing so completely naturally. The player never needs to think hard about what they need to do to beat Molt, nor are they ever confused about the obstacles to their goal. When they're powered down, the player groans or chuckles, then tries again. There's a poetry to taking what's a fundamentally complex system and turning it into something that can be intuitively understood as the setup to a throwaway punchline. A Bug's Life is not a hidden masterpiece. It never won any awards, it never created any new genres, it never changed the industry. It knows what it wants to be, an adaptation of a big blockbuster kids movie, and it's happy to be just that. But if you're looking, there's a lot of neat little touches to it. It rewards skilled players with enough cutscenes to reconstruct the bulk of the movie, a full week before the film's theatrical release. It reprises most of the film's celebrity voice actors, when it probably would have been far cheaper to cast impersonators. It hides a few bonus levels behind some pretty obscure unlock methods. This butt slide move doesn't do much, but it looks pretty funny. Despite the limited scope of their project, the developers clearly wanted to just have fun with this product, whereas so many just made something for the cheap cash grab. And hidden somewhere in all of that, toward the back, lies a boss level that shows how to design. 
for farce. <laughs> <laughs>